to fully understand the character of Isis, one must read her mythology to see how she interacts with other deities, and how she faces the many challenges that are thrown her way. Her story must begin with creation, setting the scene for how her divine family came to be. Following on from her birth, it doesn't take Isis long to build a reputation as one of the great goddesses. How she came to be known as Isis, great of magic, is essential to her whole being and to every chapter of her mythology thereafter. The key chapters of Isis and Osiris' story are scattered throughout multiple Egyptian and Greek sources. The most complete telling of the story from native Egyptian literature is from a New Kingdom hymn from the stealer of an elite man named Amemos. Much later, Greek historians such as Diodorus Siculus and Plutarch expand upon this narrative in more detail, inevitably adding their own Greek flair to the stories. It is therefore to be expected that the story changed throughout the centuries and the different authors retelling it. Today, we hear the myth through our own culture's filters of understanding, adding depth and relevance to the story for each person who hears it. The myth of Isis and Osiris is a famous one, for good reason. Heliopolis was a town known as Yunul to the ancient Egyptians and was located to the northwest of modern day Cairo. This was the cult center for the Heliopitan Ennead, a group of nine deities whose mythology forms the backdrop of the Isis Osiris story. Recorded as early as the Old Kingdom Pyramid texts is the myth of how the god Atom Ra formed new life from a self creative act. This resulted in the birth of his two children, Shu and Tefnut, the divine personifications of air and moisture. The pair wandered away from their father, causing him such distress that he sent his eye, the embodied sun disk, named the Eye of Ra, to go in search of them. Upon their return, the eye discovered that her father had replaced her with another. To placate her anger at this betrayal, Atom Ra placed her upon his head as the first Ureus serpent. Following on from this interlude, Shu and Tefnut came together and from their union sprung another pairing, Nut the sky goddess and Geb the earth god. This is an interesting example of how the Egyptians thought in a different way to cultures such as the Greeks and Romans, who traditionally viewed the earth as feminine and the sky as masculine. In early afterlife ideology, the king was believed to be reborn by the sky goddess Nut and ascended to join the imperishable stars of her body. This may be why the sky was considered a mother instead of the earth. Nut and Geb held one another in such a close embrace that no life could exist between them. Their father Shu decided to intervene, lifting Nut's body high above the earth. This great cosmological event is illustrated repeatedly in Egyptian religious art. Once the two were separated, Nut could finally give birth to the offspring that they had conceived. In a later development of the PT known as the Coffin Texts, Nut had been forbidden by Ra to give birth on any day of the 360 day year. Fortunately, the wise god Thuf came to her aid. Through a board game with the moon god, Thuf was able to win Nut five more days of the year to give birth to her offspring, bringing the year up to a total of 365 days. It is on these five epigominal days that Isis and her siblings were brought into existence. Firstborn was Osiris, who would inherit the throne of the earth from his father Geb. Second came Horus the Elder. Third came Set, who burst forth violently from his mother. Fourth was Isis, and finally Nephthys came on the fifth and final day. Thus were the Heliopitan Ennead brought forth into creation, and the stories of Isis began to unravel. The non-linear style of Egyptian mythology presents a period where the Ennead coexisted during Ra's reign on Earth. Shur had not yet taken the throne, nor had his son Geb or grandson Osiris. Despite being the supreme god and possessing great creative magic, Ra had three generations of deities beneath him and his age had begun to show. 
Isis was already renowned for knowing everything in the sky and on the earth. That is, everything except the true, secret name of Ra, a key religious concept throughout ancient Egyptian history is the belief in the power of the spoken and written word. Words had the power to manifest into reality, and someone's name was as much a living part of them as their physical or spiritual bodies. To know and speak the creator's true name was to possess a considerable piece of his great magic and to have power over him. For this reason, Ra kept his name a close secret so that none would have access to such power. I hid it in my body when I was born to prevent the power of any male or female magician coming to be against me. Isis was always seeking to learn more and desired to become a great magician. Naturally, her attention turned to this tantalizing piece of hidden information and all that it promised in its discovery. Being the creator of all things, Ra was invulnerable to the venoms of every one of his creations. In other words, none could do him harm but himself. Unfortunately for Ra, Isis was aware of this. Ra had begun to dribble in his old age, which Isis had also noticed. The clever goddess concocted an ingenious plan that would force Ra to reveal his true name to her. Whilst he was sleeping, Isis caught some of his spittle and magically fashioned a serpent from it. The next day, she covertly placed the serpent at his feet, whereupon it bit him with his own poison, the only thing with the power to harm or kill him. Feigning innocence, the goddess came to his aid, insisting that the only way she could heal him was if she knew the true name of the thing that was killing him. Ra offered up several epithets, desperately avoiding betraying his own secrets. It was no use. Finally, in desperation, he conceded to reveal his true name to Isis, under the proviso that she would pass this on to none, save for her future son and the heir of Egypt's throne. Whilst Isis hears the secret name whispered into her ear, we human readers are left in the dark, for the Egyptian texts omit recording the creator's true name. The fact that Isis is in possession of this name is of great significance. In knowing the name of everything in existence, Isis herself becomes a creatrix with power over all things. As a result of her ingenious trickery through magical means, Isis thereafter earns the title Great of Magic. Gifted with the knowledge of Ra's secret name, the goddess's speech is ever empowered by Heka a concept we could loosely translate as magic. By her word alone, she performs great protective spells. Before Isis's story further unfolds, it is important to address the concept of Hika, which Isis is great of. Hika is often translated simply as a magic, but definitions of magic are not so simple at all. What really is magic? To the Egyptians, Hika was recognized as a force which, like many other concepts, could be personified as a deity. Hika is a force, a palpable energy, which the creator formed in order to help his creations through life's trials. In this regard, magic can be understood as a natural force to be harnessed in order to cause change in one's life. It is not inherently good or bad. There is no black or white Hika. Hika is a neutral force, and it is the action which is done through using it that can be judged against one's subjective morality. Isis's magic skills were intrinsically woven into each of her myths, and whether she was fulfilling the role of queen, mother, saviour, or a funerary goddess, she was always the magician. The story now leaves the themes of creation and enters the time when Nut and Geb's firstborn son Osiris ascends to the throne of Earth. Each of their offspring were paired off together. As with most Egyptian deities, the Egyptians believed that duality maintained the balance of life, and so most deities were placed in opposite sex pairings. It is worth noting 
that the emphasis is less on heterosexual coupling and more on the balance of perceived opposites in an Egyptian worldview. In the case of the Ennead, Osiris and Isis are said to have fallen in love in the womb. Contrastingly, Set and Nephthys appear to have been paired with little affection. In some versions, Horus the Elder is omitted and Horus the Younger completes the Ennead. When he is included, Horus the Elder is the remaining fifth member and so is paired outside of the Ennead with Ra's daughter Hathor. This may be because he is a god predating the Heliopitan Ennead structure. The Egyptians had no problem with multiple versions of myths and gods, especially as they would have varied according to time and place anyway. Although Isis's motherhood of Horus appears from her origins in the Old Kingdom 5th Dynasty, it wasn't until the following dynasty that her marriage to Osiris became canon. Today, the couple are often pictured as the ultimate Hylos Gamos, the divine couple who complete one another in sexual duality and partnership. Sadly, lover's bliss is relatively short-lived for these two. Isis and Osiris mythologically reigned together as benevolent rulers who taught the invaluable secrets of agriculture to the Egyptians. Their rule encompassed the entire fertile stretch of the Nile Valley, in the area considered within the order of creation. Anything beyond this was regarded as foreign, potentially dangerous, and a place of chaos. This was the realm given to their brother, Set. Set was envious of his elder brother's throne and fertile land. This jealousy is something which Plutarch emphasized by recording an additional subplot to the story, telling of how Set's consort, Nephthys, cuckolded him with Osiris. Plutarch claims that Nephthys was in love with Osiris and disguised herself as her twin sister in order to lay beside him at night. From this secret union, the jackal-headed god Anubis was said to have been conceived. Isis discovered this, but chose to act from a place of compassion, wanting to avoid Set's wrath and not desiring to abandon the child. The two sisters raised Anubis together. This god would prove useful later in the narrative, as he became patron of embalmers. There are numerous goddesses around the world who are known for their connection to magic. Some goddesses were known in antiquity as being the ally of witches, such as the Greek Hecate, whilst others have adopted that role in more recent times, like the Welsh goddess Cloate Duen. Despite being one of the most magical of the Egyptian deities, Isis is not known as a witch goddess. Today, Isis is less viewed as a skilled magician, and instead her power is viewed as a type of divine omnipotence. Her ability to help her devotees is perceived as an act of omnibenevolent maternal compassion rather than the response of a talented magician. Perhaps this is because when Isis reached the Greek and Roman world, she was already viewed suspiciously and so her magical aspects were overridden by maternal healing qualities. The narrative thus far has explained how Isis became great in her magic, and you can learn more about how she put this great magic to use in our book, Isis by Olivia Church, who also provided the words for this video. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe and ring the bell for weekly content, and we'll see you next time.